So good morning, everyone. Well, it's great to have you here. Welcome to the MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics. My name is Chris Mejia. I'm a research scientist here, and I'm the director of the MIT Graduate Certificate for Logistics and Supply Chain Management, what we call the GCLOG program. Okay? And today, well, hopefully you will enjoy this very nice interview that Professor Josie Sheffy and Susan Lacefield are going to have in order to describe what are the future opportunities in all of this AI future work, right? And Having said that, I'm going to hand over this to my colleague, Benji Cantor, the director of the marketing and communications team. So to you. Thank you, Chris. Yep. Thank you. Welcome, uh, everyone, to the Magic Conveyor Belt, the uh, Supply Chains AI and the Future of Work, an interview with Dr. Yossi Sheffi. Um, I am here to welcome not just you in the crowd, uh, but also the close to 1,000 people that are viewing us online. We're very excited to have you here. Uh, one quick reminder, and I will do this here myself. If you have not silenced your cell phone, we are recording today, so I appreciate if you would do that. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you our host for the day, Susan Lacefield. Uh, as the executive, executive editor of CSCMP's Supply Chain Quarterly, Susan serves as the primary curator of the publication's content. And Susan was one of the founding members of the publication back in 2007, having worked prior at Supply Chain Management Review. We're so grateful, Susan, thank you for being here today. I invite you to join me in welcoming her to CTL, Susan Lacefield and Dr. Yossi Sheffi. Thank you. So I really wanted to thank Benji and Chris and all the folks at CTL for inviting me here today. Um, as a supply chain editor and professional fan of the supply chain. I feel like it's a real privilege to have a chance to sit down with Dr. Sheffy and talk about his new book, The Magic Conveyor Belt. Um, just as to give you an idea of how I see this going forward, uh, Yossi and I will be having a conversation for like 35, 40 minutes. And then we really want to hear the questions that the audience has. Um, so I'm going to rely on Benji and Chris and you all to make sure I stay on track um, so we can get to your questions, because that's the part I'm really excited about. About. And at this point, usually when I'm doing an interview like this, I would introduce the person I'm interviewing, but that feels really silly here because this is basically Yossi's house um, as the director of, of CTL. So I thought we'd just kind of dive right into the questions, Yossi. And maybe a good place to start is with the title of the book. Can you explain the analogy you make between the supply chain and the magic conveyor belt and what makes it magical? Ah, uh, well, so let's start with why. I wrote this book. Yes. And after the pandemic, a lot of people were getting to my wife <laughs> and asking her, we understand your husband is in supply chain. What is this? Right. The, uh, amazing if the, even after the pandemic, people heard a lot of supply chain, didn't know what it is. So rather than having one-on-one -on -one interview with one of the several hundred friends that my wife has, I decided <laughs> to write a book. And uh, so the first part of the book is explaining what supply chains are, why they are complex, and in some sense, why would people should not be pissed off when something is not on the shelf or not, in the, not available on Amazon, but should be amazed and awe-inspired when it's there. Once they understand what it takes to get something from the mines in China or somewhere to a finished product on a shelf, how many processes it has to go to, how many people are involved, how many different tax regimes, custom regimes it has to go through before we get um, the final product. So this was the rationale. And the magic conveyor belt is because once you understand what it takes, you think it's magic. Mm -hmm. It's very true. That's, that's, the, uh, that's the title. That's just true. So it was to, to get away from people asking you why cat, their cat food yeah, is Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So you, as you mentioned, the first book, part of the book really talks about the growing complexity of the supply chain over the past few decades. And I was wondering, do you think we're going to reach a point where companies are going to push back and say things are getting too complex and we need to maybe take a step back and look at simplifying? Or is complexity here to stay? I'm not sure. I think complexity is here to stay. Complexity is here to grow because of unexpected events that are happening. Because, um, and furthermore, I'm not sure there's a pressure to do it because a lot of the technology mm. that is being available help company deal with the complexity, help deal with the unexpected event. So I'm not sure there's a pressure to do it. 
uh, especially among large, sophisticated companies. So the answer is no. No. <laughs> it is here to stay. <laughs> here to stay. And one of the things that I liked in the book that you said is... Um, one the, of the things? One of the many, many, one many, of the many things. things. <laughs> <laughs> I said one of, yeah, no. okay. <laughs> not just one. Yeah, just two. <laughs> <laughs> is you talked about um, one of the most mind-blowing facts um, about any product that we touch is the, the thousands of organizations that have been involved in creating it and that they have done that without any central control. And I was wondering if decentralization is... You feel, do you feel that's crucial to supply chain efficiency and operating um, in this complex world? Or? The answer is categorically yes. Okay. Uh, the idea that somebody can control, control supply chain is controlling the economy. Mm -hmm. We tried it once or twice. Didn't, didn't work very well. So we're talking about modern markets. Supply chain is actually a whole set of... Uh, Buyer-seller, 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 negotiation, transaction, operation. It works because everybody is trying to do the right thing to minimize cost and maximize level of service, by and large. Now there are other, other things that people are, are worried about, like sustainability and resilience, mm -hmm. but everybody is worried about it. So everybody is trying to get the best, uh, the best outcome. I don't see how central planning can work. Um, even in China, we don't see, it's not central pr uh, planning, central control of certain aspects, but not of the, of the transaction. In fact, the Chinese seem to be leery of very large corporations mm. who control more of the uh, larger part of the economy, mm. as happened to several you know, tech companies in, uh, in China. They actually seem to encourage competition between uh, uh, between companies. So I think, I think it works. The market works. Mm. But as you introduce um, decentralization, there's an element of risk that kind of enters the equation. I was wondering, how do we balance that risk with all the benefits? No, it's a contraire. Oh, really? The risk goes down huh. because the risk to a particular company maybe, maybe goes up. There are out there on, on the front line. But the risk to the, to the economy ah. goes down. Okay. Look, you can always find good restaurant in New York. Always. You walk to a random restaurant, the chances are it's a very good one. Why? Because restaurants in New York, if you open a restaurant in New York, the chances are within a year you'll have to close it. The competition is murderous. There are so many good restaurants. So you can say the chances for an individual restaurant to succeed is not very high. Mm -hmm. But going to New York and having a good restaurant, you know, the environment is great. It works. There's no, there's no risk. You don't risk going to New York and not finding a good place to eat. Okay. I'm not saying it's a place to eat, a good place to eat, mm -hmm. because it is decentralized. Okay. But there is, when you like outsource to a supplier and they're outsourcing to other suppliers, there is that added risk of you know, a quality defect that you can't control or a sustainability issue popping up. Um, is, is that a concern with this decentralization? You know, how do you control for that sort of I thing? don't see it as a decentralization issue. Okay. Okay. I see it as the depth of the, uh, of the supply chain, the lack of visibility. It, it exists. It gets slowly better with, uh, um, with new technology, but there are limits here. The limits are that the suppliers, for suppliers to tell their customer who their supplier is, not every supplier is willing to do it. It's a competitive advantage to know who the suppliers are. And there's always the fear that the customer will go around them, will go directly to the supplier. So there's a kind of built-in opaqueness mm -hmm. to the supply chain which we're trying to get through to visibility and good relationship and all of this. And some people are more successful than others, but this issue is not a technology issue and it's not, it will be very hard to solve completely. And it's not decentralization issue. Okay. It's the depth of the supply chain. Okay. So it's a different, different, different issue. thing, different issue. So in the second half of the book, you spend a lot of time talking about artificial intelligence and the effects that AI is having on the supply chain. Um, and I was wondering, you know, when ChatGPT hit the, the scene in November, suddenly 
generative AI became a very hot topic. And I was wondering if you could talk about some of the applications for generative AI that you are seeing in the supply chain. First of all, let me just uh, explain that we have been using even oh, yeah. AI for a long time. Yes, I should have uh, prefaced that. You're absolutely time, long, correct. It's not, it's not as new as starting November, no, no. You know, uh, uh, November last year. We see, in fact, if you read today's Wall Street Journal, there was an article about the chatbots mm -hmm. using that all, all the restaurants, all the drive through restaurants are using chatbot. But it's not only drive through Every time you call now to, uh, now the customer service function, you're talking to a chatbot to interpret the results and try, uh, try to give you answer. And if sometimes it gets stuck or you get stuck and start screaming agent, 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 or something to this effect, a human comes, uh, comes on. Just like when you go to the drive-thru and you start ordering, you know, uh, champagne <laughs> and McDonald's doesn't have it, a human comes on board and says, well, I'm sorry, we don't yet serve champagne. So um, it's happening all the time. An interesting application is in risk management mm. on a supply chain. Mm -hmm. Trying to look at suppliers and finding out how risky they are. Turns out that when you look at metrics like Dan and Bradstreet and financial metrics, they are backward looking by about two quarters. You want to see what's going on now. We, all, we knew for a long time that one of, the war, one of the warning signs is having coverage about executives living, mm -hmm. about uh, having uh, uh, failing some projects, failing some M&A project in particular. Uh, having bank covenants that are uh, a little problematic. All of those are in the media, actually. So now we have several companies are using large language models, particularly, to look at tens of thousands of suppliers at the same time and analyzing all of them, analyzing all the mentioned the media of redundancy, of executive leaving, whatever, in order to generate an alert. Okay. And have somebody visit there and finding out What's, what's going on if we need to start looking for another supplier or what. So this is something that uh, could not have imagined before we had this, uh, this technology looking at. If you look at a company like, uh, I don't know, I'm working with Flex a lot, and they have 18,000 suppliers. That's just first tier suppliers. Uh, just finding out what's going on with them is, is an issue. Yes. But having a much better alert when something goes wrong, is something that uh, we were not able to do before this type of, uh, of technology was available. We could check, you know, 10 suppliers at a time. Mm -hmm. Checking tens of thousands was, was impossible. Now it, it's being done. So the AI is going to actually enable even more complexity in the supply chain in the future as we're... Yes, it can, <laughs> uh, can enable more possibilities. Mm. More possibilities create complexity. So, of, of course, when people get into, when there's pressure, economic pressure, whatever pressure, we know that during recessions, company reduce the number of SKUs. So right. they're trying to simplify. They're also trying to reduce costs to uh, you know, improve service, but they're try, trying to simplify. But, you know, there's the accordion theory of management that uh, when recession happens, the number of SKU goes down and then Marketing comes up with all the good reasons why we need more and more and more SKU to serve more and more territories, more and more cars, all kind of option. And then it, so that's the accordion yeah. theory of management. And it works actually. So it kind of, it's like the pendulum swing that kind of balances. Yeah, you know. between recessionary period, expansionary period. So we've talked a little bit about AI. Are there, and the, the benefits and possibilities of AI. Is there anything about the application of AI to the supply chain that gives you pause or areas of concern? Not, not about the supply chain. Not about the supply chain. Not about the supply chain. The areas that give me cause are the areas that give other people uh, cause. The area of uh, fake news right. can be done very, very convincingly. Yes. Uh, the area of uh, giving instruction how to build, you know, 
improvise roadside explosives there. But I'm, while I'm saying this is a concern, a concern in, uh, in the media, and I'm not that concerned about it because just to give you an idea, unlike uh, the early days of the internet, when we all, everybody thought this is the greatest thing since sliced bread, right? Because we can communicate with everybody, families can see each other, all the you know, distance is dead, to quote uh, Tom Friedman. Nobody thought about identity theft and, you know, uh, stealing customer data and uh, terrorists communicating to each other on, on the net. Now it's different. With the generative AI, the companies, the media, the politicians are all aware of the dangers. Mm -hmm. So there are, there's a lot of work is going on already. Already, the companies themselves are putting guardrails on this. Okay. So if you talk, if you uh, get ChatGPT or any one of the others and ask how to prepare a Molotov cocktails, it's not going to answer. So this is not... I'll give you an answer. So they already started to put guardrail and there'll be more of this. Are you seeing that also with um, use of analytics in companies where, you know, you might have an algorithm? There's an example in the book about two uh, competing bookstores and they're both using yeah. a pricing algorithm on Amazon. And yes. uh, as a result, that drove up the price of the book very high. Are you yes. seeing companies are already have those human interventions in place to make sure that the algorithms don't go out of control? Let me give you a more even general answer. Okay. One of the most important type of work in the future will be monitoring. Mm. Letting the automation in AI infuse or otherwise, but having a human monitoring, that's a tough job. Yeah. It's a tough job because you have to monitor something that you don't do every day, and actually you lose expertise. Right. It's hard, it's hard to keep sharp. Um, and we have cases when, you know, things things uh, did go awry. So this would be, a, it's important. How do we train people to do it? Yes. Um, for example, today modern aircraft can basically fly by itself gate to gate. Now, talking about autonomous vehicles, not too many people will go on a, you know, aluminum cylinders that fly 35,000 feet over the ocean without, without a pilot. Right. But um, why did I go this? I, I lost my turn of thought. That's okay. We're, we're talking about training. And we're talking about training. Yes. So, uh, mm -hmm. so the pilots are in, in, in the aircraft. They actually don't need to do anything. They can just sit there and nap. Mm -hmm. But what we do, we let them do the communication, basically. Okay. It's the number one job. So they always have to communicate and change frequency so they keep alert. It's mm -hmm. one way to do it. Because... Flying the airplane, it flies itself. So you really don't, once you put, you put the crow, it flies, it changes routes, it go, goes, goes automatically. But you give some jobs to the, to the human, mm -hmm. they're not going to fall asleep. That's part of the challenge of the future. There are several models how people and machine can work together. You know, one such model is what we talk about, the, the chatbot. The chatbot has a monitor because... You talk to McDonald, whatever, in the drive-thru, you actually talk to a chatbot in most places. And they respond, and then when they don't understand something, a human comes, um, comes on. Mm -hmm. And you talk to you. So there's a monitoring of what's going on, and the minute that the chatbot doesn't understand what's going on or gives the wrong answer or whatever, a human comes. So that's, a, that's actually a monitoring function that we... Don't even think about it, but it happens every day with most customer service um, function. You know, it used to be that press one for this, press two for this, press three for this. That's rare now. Right. Now you just talk to the to the computer and it turns it into text that appear on somebody's screen and then they report and try to find an answer. So that's AI. Mm -hmm. Do you have any good examples of companies that are doing good thinking around what should be given to humans to do in the supply chain and what should be um, outsourced to AI? Okay, that's, uh, that's, to me, that's the question of the future. Yeah. The question of how to integrate the integration of humans and AI-infused automation is a question of the future. So we talk about one model. The monitoring is one model. Yes. 
You can think about uh, when the human is in the loop. The human is in the loop, for example, think about an Amazon warehouse. When a person, when the picker stands in one place and there's a, you know, the aisle comes to the picker, does something, then another aisle comes to the picker. So the human is in the flow of the work. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's another example. And a third example is the human operates. The, uh, uh, when you go to several um, automotive plants, for example, you see workers standing with iPad-like devices and basically running the robots. Right. Uh, so that's, a, that's another way of, uh, of working with AI. So that's, as I said, the question of the future, how to organize the work. Exactly. And how to, in some sense, how to get the best out of the machine and out of the human, because they have complementary skills. Right. You know, machines work all the time, don't get breaks. Don't go, don't, don't go to the bathroom, they just work. And get they, sick. they don't get sick. They usually, um, so, and they're usually very accurate. They do, you know, repeated work over and over time. What machines don't have is context. Understanding when something does not belong, has to change, when something, when we think about, um, you know, something change in the economy and suddenly people order things differently. So many uh, standard automated ordering, automated ordering systems use the point of sale data and order based on this, put it into some forecast. But if there's a, this forecast is based on, at best, say on machine learning, which is basically looking at past data. All forecasts are based on past data. When something is changing, Structurally, suddenly there's a pandemic, suddenly there's a, you know, something else happening and people change their buying habits, then humans have to, have to intervene again because the machine does not have context. As the machine is concerned, nothing changed. I mean, it, it gets, you know, point of sale data, it keeps going, but something has changed and people understand the context. Now, there's other things about empathy and bias and things uh, in general that the uh, human can make sure that uh, happen or don't happen. Mm -hmm. it's, it's harder for machines. Do you think we're going to get to that point where machines are going to be better at that or mimicking that empathy piece? Because it feels like the people who are working on AI are trying to get there. You know, see AI used in mental health these days. And yes. <laughs> There are some actually automated uh, psychologists that uh, try to help people. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> it's, uh, can you? I'm not sure about this because it's, that, that's exactly a question of context. Yes. Uh, two people coming and saying, you know, I hate my children. <laughs> or I hate my supplier. <laughs> I hate my supplier. Uh, well, you hate the supply, you don't go to a, <laughs> to, 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 to a psychologist, yeah. but uh, you know, you hate your children, you go to a psychologist. <laughs> and, uh, but the context may be entirely different. You know, I hate my child because he's a thief and a liar, or I hate my child just because I don't like tall kids. I, I don't know, who knows? <laughs> I mean, the, the, the context it's is matters. It's breaking my neck. <laughs> I so, to. It's hard to imagine some of these things moving to, oh. uh, uh, yeah. to, uh, to AI completely. Mm -hmm. And they talk about supplier, again, it is hard to imagine, or I, let me put it strongly, I don't think in the next N years, when N is five, 10 years, we will have, be able to have an algorithm setting up a contract with a supplier in China or Vietnam, let's say, to set up a contract and relationship for a long while, it requires somebody to fly to Vietnam to negotiate like hell for two days and then sit and have dinners or two dinners and talk about the kids and talk about the family and create relationship. It's, I don't see it changing in the near future. I mean, AI will have to be so much better and have to have another quantum jump in, in, in capability to be able to do it, which right now, not clear it's possible. 
It's interesting though, because there's been a movement with technology of making decisions more fact-based as opposed to, you know, I like Joe over at so it's in such trucking a company, so we're gonna use him. Um, how do, but you're, it seems like that human relationship is, you're saying is still gonna be an integral part of supply chain management in the future. Yes, it is still in, in be integral because, for example, if something goes wrong and there's some disruptions, how do I make sure that this supplier knows my situation, knows me? Mm -hmm. And if I'm calling and say, really, look, I really need it, and everybody else calls and say, I need, I really it, need it, yeah. but I know this guy, and I know that he really needs it. Uh -huh. So the, the knowledge is, I think, still very important, the personal, personal relationship. Now, one has to be real there. There may be uh, critical suppliers, and maybe suppliers that are not so critical. Right. And if they... Maybe supplier, if I have some part, uh, some, some commodity that I have dozens of suppliers, and if that supplier goes down or, or I have some shortage, there are many others, maybe that I don't need to be close to them. But for most important suppliers, I, I don't see any other way. Sometimes it's hard to know which are your critical suppliers. You might need that little screw, and then suddenly that screw goes yeah, down. It's now. called in the automotive business, they call it the golden screw. It's uh -huh. one part that's meeting, and you cannot make a car. Right. Right, the example in your book about the Ford, Ford not being able to ship out because they didn't have the little Ford logo that sticks was, on the truck. This was last year. You know, Ford has the blue little oval that they put in the front of the truck. They didn't have them during the shortages uh, we had. They couldn't make trucks. I mean, they, the trucks were standing in the, uh, in the yard and they couldn't, couldn't sell them for a month, actually. So can AI be helpful of identifying who it is that you need to spend your time developing that human relationship with. It might not be who you think it is. You also have to... The question... You can take AI. I think it's simpler. You know, but as an aside, let me say that uh, AI became a buzz, the buzzword, buzzword of the time. Yeah. We used to think about blockchain or RFID or became... And, uh, you know, people who are doing blockchain projects, they're actually just fixing up their you know, uh, systems, and they, to get funding from management, they call it, that's a blockchain project. Now they call it, that's an AI project for doing some optimization. So, so that's the learning to go away. When that, you go back to your company, make sure your project is AI. <laughs> use AI. Okay, what, what exactly are you using? And it is appropriate. I mean, the idea that, uh, huh, can that tell you how many companies are there that the, the tail is wagging the dog? Yeah. I used to go to um, boards and people would ask the CEO, what's your China strategy? Or what's your blockchain strategy? Now they ask, what's your AI strategy? And I always said, stop it. What's your problem? <laughs> Start with the problem. <laughs> right. Maybe the solution is AI. Maybe it's just hiring another person. Maybe it's, <laughs> it's, I mean, it's not, you don't start with the solution, but it's amazing how many people still do it. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know, in part because Wall Street pays premium for, for having an AI strategy or right. something of this effect? Ah, it's not clear to me. It makes no sense. Can AI, is, is figuring out the problem an AI issue or, a, or a, a essentially human issue? Is that something that's going to... AI issue, you know, operation research issue, statistics issue, you know, people issue, process issue. It can be anything. Yeah. So that's why I don't like having an AI strategy or a you know, blockchain strategy or whatever is the current Fed. Right, right. A, I should say AI is not Fed. It's, a, it's been growing for many, many years. And we got to the point that uh, it could make substantial changes in how people work. Mm -hmm. and the, the relationship between people and machine. Right. We were seeing... Uh, just a, like a year earlier, I think the buzzword was all robotics. So it's it's kind of, or co cobots, or, and so it's the same Rob sort of thing. Robotics are also now fused by AI. Right. I mean, so. Right. It's not the actual hardware of the robot. It's, it's the, the software. Hardware, the, of course. Yeah. yeah. So um, kind of taking a step back to your point about contacts and the, the pilots and training, you, sometimes you have to do all the, the, 
the low level jobs to get that context to know when there's what to do next. So yes, I do talk about it. Yes. So what can we do with our supply chain pilots, so so to speak, to make sure that they have the background, the knowledge to to be able to take over those unusual events. Again, I take the problem a little further from your question. Okay. Um, so I was interviewing a, a shop, basically a software software provider, asking them about ChatGPT taking taking the job because it can now program. Mm -hmm. They say. The senior program, the senior computer scientists are not worried about it, but it may take the job of the junior computer scientists. And I was saying, guess what? Senior computer scientists don't come as senior computer scientists. They start as junior computer scientists. You don't hire junior computer scientists. You don't have work for them. You are not going to have senior computer scientists. So there's a... And even for, for monitoring, for, you need people with experience. Mm -hmm. In the book, I talk a lot about uh, how to do it and uh, how to upgrade skills. But there has to be a recognition that you need to hire people, people at, the, uh, at the lowest level. One of the suggestions that I made is, uh, one of the thought, is uh, maybe pivot in the United States for more of the German system of people spending half time in a company and half time in a university, mm -hmm. and they come up, it's called the dual education system. That's about 52% of the German high schoolers go into this system, which is uh, government controlled. The government defines Germany. So the government defined three, 365 uh, you know, professions where this can be done. And the university, uh, you apply to, to actually to the company, and they work with a local college or university. You spend half the time studying the theory, basically, and half the time uh, doing the work. 70% of these people get hired by the company that they do the internship with, but they come with experience, knowing the culture, knowing the company. It's much higher to move them, much easier to move them along. In the United States, we suffer another problem is this, this every mother wants to say that the child goes to college. Uh, my child goes to so-and-so college, and your child just goes to trade school. I always say that people should meet my Plumber. Yeah. Uh, my plumber is driving a Rolls Royce. Yeah. Just saying. It's not uh, a Bentley, actually. My, uh, mm -hmm. my plumber drives a, drives a Bentley. And we don't have enough plumbers. And they can set the price. And they do set it high. So uh, we send there are too many people who go to college in the United States. And unfortunately, in many cases, it comes up with after college debt for a long, long period rather than go to trade schools right. and community colleges uh, or combination. Actually, there's a university here that does it, uh, Northeastern. Northeastern, yes. The combination of work, and it's not as organized as in Germany, but it's the same idea. You work uh, one semester, you study one semester, and you, change, you flip between them. So. And it's, it's interesting. I, I feel like more and more people are, are, Northeastern is becoming a school that more and more people want to go to the, nowadays. I know. Yeah. I came to the United States about the dark ages, yeah. <laughs> many, many years ago in 1975. You could walk into Northeastern yeah. and, and, and get in. They were just glad to have, you needed to have a pulse in order to go to Northeastern. They now became a very, very selective school. They are about 14. It's 12, 12, 14 percent acceptance rate. There, and, and almost everybody who gets accepted comes in. Yeah. So it's a, it become a really selective school because of this. People start to realize that it may be a good idea. Yes, and a lot more students from all across the country are looking to come oh, yes. to Northeastern. Oh, yes, it used to be a local school. It used to be a local school. Yes. So that comes back to, to your main job of training students. Have, how have what you feel are the necessary skills for a supply chain manager changed recently? <laughs> OK. And how do you train that sort of? Uh, look, if I go over the history, we started this program here started a very analytical program. Right. And then we realized that our graduates who are very analytically savvy, end up working for Harvard MBAs 
who are half as smart and get paid twice as much. We said, this is, good at talking. <laughs> this is not working. <laughs> furthermore, furthermore, furthermore um, companies came to us and say, your graduates don't go up, up the ladder in the company because they need the soft skills. Yeah. They need to be able to communicate. They need to be able to sell. They need to be able to explain a position. They need to be able to work in a team. So the programs changed. Mm -hmm. Started doing a lot more of this. I think that as we get, as AI and um, is getting more and, and automation is getting more and more into the workplace, is the soft skills that will become even more important. Mm -hmm. Become another. How do you work in team? How do you make sure? that uh, your people can work with the, with the AI. How you can make sure that, you know, the promise of AI is that it will do the job that nobody wants to do, and people will do the more interesting and fulfilling job. How do you make sure that this actually happens? Yeah. Uh, so all of this is part of the uh, challenge of the future. We don't have all the answer yet. Right. We don't even have some of the answer yet. But we're thinking about it. <laughs> so it's um, people will need to understand. We're not training computer scientists, but people need to understand the capabilities and where it can go wrong. Mm -hmm. So people need to be sophisticated users. It's like um, my colleague Chris Kaplis always talks about the, you know, driving. There are mechanics who actually can fix the car and know what's inside, and they're drivers. You don't have to know what's going on. You can just operate it. Right. We like to train drivers, uh -huh. people who, can, who understand what the system can or cannot do, but they don't need to be builders of, uh, of AI, of generative AI system. But they need to do the promise, the limitation, and how to best use them. Yes. People always ask me if, if I allow, in classes, if we allow people to use ChatGPT. That's a big debate in universities. Some universities absolutely disallow it. It's ridiculous. It's like disallowing, you know, let me go back. When I was your age and actually younger, I used, they used to teach me how to take square root by hand. None of you studied it mm -mm. because they are calculators. Mm -hmm. None of you are studying how to do a financial statement by hand because there's now Excel and spreadsheets. So the question is, why do you need to do to replicate what ChatGPT can do by hand? What you need to do is when it goes awry, when it starts making, you, you need to test it. You need to make sure that the results are not what, what they call hallucinations. <laughs> so, uh, because ChatGPT then hallucinate and invent stuff, invent sometimes reference that don't exist. Uh, so you need to be sure of this because one thing, if you, you can submit to me a paper written by ChatGPT as long as you realize that if something is wrong, OpenAI is not uh, getting an F, you're getting an F. Yeah. Just, just so we understand each other. So. Uh, in short, the responsibility is still on the user. But not using a tool that's available for me, it's, it's, it's a losing proposition. You cannot, it's very hard uh, to work. Another example, you know, when you, of, of how automation is de-skilling jobs and, but having other benefits. So if you go to London and you go to a black cab, you know, to drive a black cab in London, you have to study for three or four years and pass an exam which is considered the, the toughest exam in the world. Because you need to know every point of interest in London and how to go from everywhere to everywhere. And you sit in an exam that you have to show that you can drive from everywhere to everywhere in the shortest route. And you have to understand congestion and you have to understand. People were doing this and spending four years of their life doing it. And then came Google Maps and Uber. Everybody can do it. Now, there are still the number of um, um, black taxis in London went from 25,000 to about 8,000. But the number of Ubers available is now about 60,000 in, in London. Lots more of them are, are available. So win some, lose some. I wonder if the black cabs in London, if now they are serving a very different 
customer base? Are they serving a lot of the tourists who kind of want of course. the experience of riding in a black cab? And if go, that's what we're going to be have to be thinking about too. Go on a red bus and go on a black cab. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a, usually you take whoever is coming. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Whereas a, the guy who needs to get across the, uh, the city just wants. Yeah. Um, these have all been great. Um, so another thing you talk about in the book is how technology has had an impact on enabling supply chain strategy. Like we wouldn't have been able to do all the outsourcing and offshoring if there, we didn't have advanced communication technology. And do you see some radical changes on how companies will be structuring their supply chain or organizing it because of AI, the AI or other emerging tech like robotics? Uh, look, it's already happening in the sense that uh, the number one use of robotics is in warehouse automation. I mean, warehouses are putting robots like there's no tomorrow. Uh, autonomous vehicles. Uh, autonomous vehicles are robots. Uh, so, there's a lot of work on autonomous trucking. Yeah. Let me just say, however, that I talk to a lot of people, a lot of interviewing people are worried about the jobs. It's the number one, you know, fear, jobs. And um, again, people should chill at least for the short term because mm -hmm. it doesn't happen fast. Uh, give you one example. In 1892, AT&T invented the... Uh, automatic telephone exchange. Until then, there were, you know, women putting plugs. Uh, where is Mrs. Smith today? She, she went to the supermarket. I'll connect you later. Very personal service. That's what my grandma did. Yeah, okay. <laughs> By 1950, there were still 350,000 operators like this in the United States. Only by the 1980s, it started to, to go really close to zero. Nine decades from the invention until it really, um, all the jobs went away, or most of the jobs went away. So it takes time, and it takes time because there are many hurdles. You see already hurdles. You see, the, what are the writers and actors uh, oh, yeah. uh, worried about? They're worried about using AI. Yeah. And they are, you know, stopping the industry, putting the industry down. And the industry will have to come to some kind of, of agreement my guess will be part of the agreement will be somehow slowing down or putting guardrails on the use of AI. Kind of like dock workers with um, I was about Coast. to say, Sorry. dock <laughs> workers also fight automation. Yeah. Uh, LA, Long Beach is nothing like Rotterdam or Singapore or Dubai because of the afraid for the job, afraid for the immediate job, and not taking into account that you can increase the throughput and get even more jobs. Right for this, or there'll be more jobs elsewhere in the industry. In general, that's the most difficult thing in this area, in this, um, when people are worried about jobs, and I understand it, is anxiety because you know that people are gonna lose their job. You see it in the supermarket when you get to, when you can check out yourself. People are gonna lose their jobs. So these are people that you know. What you don't know is all the new industry and the new jobs will come. So one quick example of this that is, Old example. So Ford went, came up with the with the uh, assembly line system, change manufacturing, of course. But it used to be that specialty team used to build one car at a time, and Ford had several thousand workers. During the height of the Model T, using the assembly line, Ford had about 150,000 workers. But this is not the big impact. The big impact was that automobiles became less expensive. Highway develop, um, hotels, motels, restaurants, the whole hospitality industry created millions of jobs. This was not what Henry Ford had in mind. <laughs> I mean, but it was a side effect of, 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 of what happened. That is why it is so hard to imagine all the new jobs will, that, that will come. Many of the jobs that exist today for, did not exist, you know, a few decades ago. Uh, who thought a few decades ago about people who will optimize ads on Google? Or people, there are so many jobs that are totally new because of new industries that, uh, that came up. So this will, 
it's hard to predict what yeah. will be, you know, uh, all the new. The one thing about supply chain coming back, because that's what you ask about, is it still involves physical movement. Yeah. Product, product have to move. So there are some things that are that will be still grounded for a long time until we start having 3D printing at scale. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. can change, mm -hmm. change supply chain. But uh, it, will, it will be a long time because it, uh, 3D printing is still very slow technology. It cannot, uh, cannot replace mass production, not even close to replace mass production. So I, I don't see fundamental changes. The changes that may come will come because of geopolitical you know, uh, consideration, resilience consideration, sustainability consideration, because, but this, to get this done, we'll need to have some more system thinking, which is in very short supply. Mm. Uh, among the political class, the media class, people are talking about, um, you know, give you an example. Rare earth minerals are used in every sophisticated product now. China controlled 80, 90% of the world supply. Aluminum, China controlled most of the world supply and stored, most of the smelters are, are, are in China. You know which country has more rare earth mineral in the ground than China? The United States. But we don't want to mine it because it's environmentally problematic. Even though one should say, if it will be done in the United States, it will be probably done in a lot more, in a way, lot more responsible way than it's done in China. But still, so we have to decide. We have to stop saying and green is, and we just go green. Right. We go security. We go standard of living. I, we have to think more holistically. And this is system thinking that, as I say, in, in short supply, because there are pressure groups, whether they green parties in Europe or environmental uh, lobbies in the United States. There are the, the you know, the security hawks that want, that, that want everything to be uh, from here. But again, from supply chain point of view, moving the assembly or the last stage of manufacturing to the United States is meaningless or to, or to Europe is meaningless because there's a whole supply chain that was built after in investment of billions of dollars and decades that uh, they're still in China. Very hard to get out of this. It will take billions of dollars and decades yeah. to, get, to get out of there. So we need to stop talking about totally, you know, um, separating the, the, the Chinese and the, and the Western economies and starting to wait to work better together. It, it's just not realistic. So no, no two. What is it? What are the two pronged or two pronged supply chain? Yeah. It, it's not real. It's it's a nice thought. It's just not realistic. I I think because people don't realize how much is there already. Yeah. That is very hard to move uh, to move. And by the way, even if you move some manufacturing, how much of the resources are coming are mined in, in uh, you know not in the West. Right. So still need that. And as long as you depend on something. You're not really independent. Well, I see Benji standing up, so that's my cue that it's time for the audience to ask their questions. Um, I would be really interested to hear what reflections you have for Dr. Sheffield. There's some, somebody here, somebody there. Hello, um, Victor Silva from Chile. Uh, people are having a hard time getting used to new technologies due to the speed, the speed at which they appear. Uh, not not even leaving young people or young adults time to adapt. How can we solve this from the perspective of a company, knowing that adapting to new technologies is even more hard for them? Good question. Okay, so uh, the, for those who didn't hear it, the question was adaptation to new technology among uh, young and old uh, alike. So two answers. First of all, good new technology make it simple to use. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of what uh, um, companies are investing in is making the technology simpler to use. You guys don't remember when you had only green screen and you had to type stuff. You now do, you know, uh, move a mouse on the... It's a huge advance by the technology industry to make it simpler to use. 
So the, a lot of these uh, are getting simpler to use. So that's one, one drive. Another drive, the problem is not that it gets simpler to use. The problem is that you have to understand the output and make sure that it's, that it's correct. And that's, that's very hard. That requires education and training and learning. And there's just no, no way around it. The real challenge, I think, is not so much large companies who are actually investing in this. Many, many companies are investing in uh, upgrading employees' um, capabilities. I think the big problem is all the gig workers, the independent workers, the small companies that don't have the resources to take time off and invest in uh, upgrading skills. And as it pains me to say that I think this is a good role for government. Mm -hmm. uh, that um, government has to be able to have the ability to pay for people to upgrade skills. And I'm not sure how to do it, I'm not sure how to fund it, but uh, that's a role for government because other otherwise the fear is inequality will grow substantially. Definitely. And, uh, that's not good for democracy, it's not good for, for the country, it's not good for anything. Sure. Hey, Toby Gooley from CTL. A related question. Given the uh, growing, inevitable, inevitably growing importance of, of AI in supply chain management, how should that be incorporated into supply chain professional and academic education? Is that something that's a must have for every program? What do you see happening there? What would you recommend? Okay, again, this is something that I think I uh, touch slightly. The question is to what level you want to train people. You want to train people to be able to write algorithm? That's not supply chain function. You want to train people to understand how to use and how to, to know the promise and limitation of algorithm? Yes, that is something that you do, and you do it with, just like we teach every, everything else, with the exercise and case studies and lectures and you know, uh, examples and give, bringing people from companies who show how they, uh, how they do it, but uh, that's the point. To what level you want to, you know, to get people? I would say in supply chain, we want to get people to be good users and understanding the technology, but not people. We, we don't have to strive to have people who can, uh, you know, develop the technology. Now, look, at the same time, let me just say, there, are, there will be a few people. I'm not sure there will be supply chain people, but there will be a few people in every company who will be, Technologist will be basically data scientists, be able, the company who now, when you go to the drive-thru and you talk to a chatbot, you talk to a, a in, in several, uh, uh, several retailers, several uh, restaurants, you talk to a system that sits on top of open AI developed by the company itself. So it recognizes things on the menu and it recognizes if you want it can answer what is gluten free and what is not. It can do, so it can do certain related things, but you cannot, if, if you ask it about champagne for breakfast, it, it, it gets stumped. It, it doesn't know how, how to deal with it. So it deal with it. So this, this was developed inside the company. So there are people inside the company who understand how to build on top of uh, open AI. They do a lot of other applications. I'm not sure these people will be in supply chain specifically, but there'll be some kernel of expertise in the companies to do things that are applicable to this company. Hi, this is Sri Devi from CTL. Uh, I think AIs uh, tend to think the way they are trained to think or taught to think. So from that perspective, uh, do you think AIs are also subject to psychological biases that humans have and, also, and hence make erroneous decisions? Okay, for those who didn't hear, the question was, is my book available on Amazon? <laughs> Let's talk about, uh, yes. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, the question. 
that had to do with biases in the, uh, in the algorithm. Sure. The problem is not so much built-in biases. Those exist, of course, but this is something that's specifically built in. But biases in the training data that the people who use it don't even realize they are there in the training data. And this has to be, you know, found out by people, by running the algorithm, by trying it. If you find out that the, a bank that uses uh, AI to decide on uh, the risk for a loan certainly doesn't, you know, approve loans for certain type of people, you want to go in and find out what's going on. Um, but it, it can be unintended. Uh, because it's just the training that is collected from lots of data. In what, for example, if the bank in the past had, you know, gave, gave loans only to certain kind of people, not to others, it will be in the training data of that bank. So one has to correct for it. Uh, but it requires human intervention. Again, context. Require human intervention. Uh, good morning, Jorge Haldin from Bolivia. Hello. Glad to be here. Uh, my question is, uh, what potential do you see in artificial intelligence technology like convolutional networks to interpret images and video? Uh, how can this impact the supply chain management uh, works or, or jobs? Because interpreting images and videos could be uh, uh, make things more easier. Yes, absolutely. We'll be able to... Uh, just like a uh, chatbot are able to interpret uh, speaking words, it's actually easier to interpret what's in an email, what's in a message, what's in a, you know, EDI, uh, and take action based on this. In fact, um, in many cases, you are already doing, the, the, you're already interacting with it. You send messages to some companies and Several things can happen. Either a chatbot comes out and say, I'm Linda and I want to talk to you. It's always a woman for some reason. Um, you know, started chatting with them. You're chatting with, a, you're chatting with an AI system. You're chatting with a chatbot. If you talk to, if you try to look for a car, you look at the Honda dealership, Linda will come out and try, uh, you know, try to talk to you. And what you do with this, you actually write down stuff. You write it, the chatbot picks it up and writes back. So it's already happening. Um, whether it will start happening with emails, yes. The question is only when and people develop the system. There's so much development going on that it's hard to say when, but clearly it will happen. I'm really looking forward to that application because I need something to help me with my out of control email inbox. Out of control email, yes. Uh, I think we out have time for one more question. Oh, put the. Yeah, there's a question there. Oh, there's one over here. <laughs> Dueling. <laughs> go to two. Okay. Go to David. Thank you. I'll, I'll be quick. Thank you so much for this. Um, you mentioned um, two particular incidents that caught my my ears: the striking the striking port workers and the striking actors. And I was thinking about how those are both industries that were particularly struck by COVID nineteen disruptions. Mm. Port workers. There was a, you know the big story about all the ships that were off off the port of Los Angeles, Long Beach, and in in Hollywood they couldn't produce for a long time. And I guess I just wonder if you see a connection between industries that were struck especially hard by COVID-19 and the acceleration of AI that might lead to these strikes. Okay, that's a, actually a question. Again, I'm going meta on your, on, on your question. Because when we will start having, when you will start having more and more email interaction with coworkers, with your boss, when you start to have more interaction between um, worker, between project member, between team, it will be automated. This will be easier because more people work at home because of, because of COVID. And they are, you have anyway less face-to-face -face interaction. And maybe over time, people will start value less face-to-face -face interaction. 
So the, you have all these all these things working uh, working together. Whether you're talking about this industry in terms of industry that were uh, that were hurt, uh, many industries uh, uh, were hurt. I don't see universities, schools going on strikes. They were certainly hurt, uh, closed by uh, by this. Public school teachers. Yeah, public school teachers, but they perennially go on strikes. <laughs> it's, a, it's not, I'm not sure. It's a, I think it's they're under a little more stress now because of the COVID, so they're maybe they're more likely to go on strike. I'm sorry, that's a totally different subject. That's now okay. I'll fuck up. It's <laughs> okay. Um, so I, do you see a connection? I, I, I don't, I'm not sure. I see, I see a connection between the, say, we talk about strikes, the, um, the labor stand on yellow truck line, that they are willing to let yellow go bankrupt because there is such shortage of truck drivers that the, the membership is not going to be hurt by this. The membership is going to find other jobs. And maybe with the result of the pandemic, we have the shortage of truck drivers and all this. So you see, because it's amazing that the uh, union is willing to let 33,000 workers just lose their job. Um, but that's the stance. I mean, they're they are ready to strike. Um, Yellow was not paying for the pension already. So, it, and actually, customers are leaving Yellow. So they're, uh, they're really in dire strait and they're gonna go under unless the union gives them some uh, uh, ability to operate differently. And it doesn't look it. So again, it has to do with the situation of, uh, of labor. About the, I'm, if I would be a screenwriter or an actor, I would be worried. This job can be replaced to a large extent by AI. Um, where the, look, screenplay from Hollywood are so, you know, you can predict what they say. You can predict the ending in, in, in 99 out of 100 uh, movies. It's not a surprise. So as long as this is standard stuff, ChatGPT can do it better. Uh, once in a while, of course, you'll have indie movies that break the mold and do something different. Sure, this will uh, require. But for the bulk of the work, especially from Hollywood, give me a break. It is so... <laughs> So predictable, and so the, you can see how things go if you if you watch enough movies. So um, yeah, I, I, about this particular strike, I would say they are they are not in a winning uh, not in a winning position. And the problem mainly is what we forget. We look at the stars who make millions of dollars, but the um, most actors make hardly living ways. They also work in other areas. Workers, writers, everybody in the business working in other areas. Like 90% of them are, the salary from the, from the movie is below the poverty line. So those people are gonna break. It's, uh, it will be very hard for them to continue. We'll see. One last question. Hi, Professor. Better be a good one. <laughs> Just, no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> but be yeah. Otavio from Brazil. I wanted to know a little bit more about the central, decentralized supply chain and its complexity. And uh, given the recent events that we are seeing in the world, like the war in Ukraine, uh, China moving towards Taiwan, I want to get your view if this is going to affect supply chain, world supply chain somehow, and uh, how companies, uh, what companies need, need to do if this affects their supply chain. Huh. Okay, my guess, if China is gonna take Taiwan, the last thing you should worry about is supply chain. <laughs> this will be, uh, if the United States will, will start a war with China, that's uh, Armageddon. That's, uh, you know, I, not clear how this will happen. Or two superpowers with nuclear, you know, <laughs> nuclear arsenal going against each other. That's uh, unthinkable. So I'm not sure. Uh, supply chain are going to be affected, of course, but that's not going to be the issue. Um, it's also, 
Look, the United States, by and large, can grow its own food. Because uh, we started talking about the basics, about food and medicines, and the United States is not independent in terms of many medical supplies. Um, but neither is China. See, that's, that's the issue. China is also not independent. And uh, the reason that China invests in, the, in all the infrastructure all over the world is basically to, create, to get a lot of material out of these places. Well, all these sea lanes will be closed instead of, instead of a war between the United States. You cannot be able to get stuff from Africa to China. So uh, it's not clear what will happen. <laughs> It's uh, very hard. But by and large, of course, geopolitical tension, whether the war in Ukraine or even just tension in terms of tariffs, do impact supply chain, of course, and, and make it more difficult to operate, more complex to operate, but uh, not impossible. Anyway, let me stop here and thank you. Thank you, USC. This has been a great conversation. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>